In this chapter, we're going to look at viruses. Viruses are infectious particles that are going to consist of genes packaged in a protein coat. They're generally not considered alive because they are missing much of the host cell machinery that is needed to make copies of themselves or reproduce. So a virus will have a nucleic acid and then it's surrounded by a protein coat and there's very little else in viruses. They were first discovered when we were studying the tobacco mosaic virus which caused a mosaic or mottled appearance on leaves and it was noticed that it was transmitted plant to plant when sap from a diseased plant was rubbed on a healthy plant. When we look at the structure of viruses, they come in different shapes. These are illustrations of the shapes and you'll see they're actually pretty right on when we look at the electron microscope pictures of them, including the one that looks like a little spaceship at the end. They're small. The smallest of them is only about 20 nanometers in diameter, and it's smaller than a ribosome. The largest one has a diameter of several hundred nanometers. This means we will not be able to see them underneath the light microscope. They also take on different shapes, and they can have different genomes. Their genome can be linear or circular. It can be double-stranded or single-stranded, and it can be DNA or RNA. The capsid is going to be the protein shell around the outside. It can be rod-shaped, polyhedral, or more complex shapes. The capsomeres are the individual protein subunits. So with the helical viruses, they're rod-shaped because you've got just a single capsomere that's going to coil up in a rod shape. The icosahedral is going to have identical proteins arranged in a polyhedral capsule. We've got 20 triangular facets. And then there can be more complex shapes. The viral envelopes are going to be membranous envelopes that surround the capsid. You'll see this with the influenza virus and several others. It's derived from the host cell membrane in many cases. Some will even have enzymes within the capsids. Your bacteriophages or phages are viruses that will infect bacteria. The first phages that were studied were seven that infected E. coli, and they were just named T1 through T7. Viruses have to replicate in host cells. They're obligate intracellular parasites because they lack enzymes and equipments for making protein. Their host range is going to be limited. They have a limited number of species that they can affect, infect. They have to identify their host by a lock and key fit between the viral surface proteins and specific receptors on the cell. Viruses have to bind the host cell and then the genome enters the cell. So when we look at the replication feature here, you've got the DNA, the capsid of this virus that's going to bind to the host cell. It's going to insert the viral DNA, and you're going to use that DNA to make capsid proteins from an mRNA. You'll also make copies of that viral DNA. These will spontaneously self-assemble into new viruses and then exit and infect new host cells. In most cases, it's going to damage or destroy the host in the process. When we look at the phages, we've got two different cycles, the lytic cycle and lysogenic cycle. So with the lytic cycle, this is going to result in host cell death. T4 is our example here. So we have here the phage attaching, and it's going to enter, send in its own DNA and degrade the host DNA. It's going to use the host cell machinery to synthesize viral genomes and proteins that will spontaneously assemble, and then it will lyse the cell and release all of those viral particles. A lot of times we will, these will release 100 to 200 phage particles, so what started out as one infected cell in the next generation will be 100 to 200 infected cells. It allows them to amplify pretty quickly. A virulent phage is going to be one that replicates only by that lytic cycle. The restriction enzymes are the cellular enzymes that they use to cut up DNA. These are actually used in DNA technology as well. You can use them to cut up DNA and analyze pieces of the DNA. With the lysogenic cycle, this allows replication of a phage genome without destroying the host. These are sometimes referred to as temperate phages because they're capable of using both the lytic and lysogenic cycles. 
the lambda phage is our example here. So the lambda phage is going to bind to that host bacterial cell and inject its DNA in. The phage DNA circulizes. Depending on factors going on inside the cell, you can have it either progress to the lytic cycle where it will lyse the cell or it can go into the lysogenic cycle. If it goes into the lysogenic cycle, that phage DNA is going to integrate into the host cell chromosome. We call this a prophage when it's integrated into the bacterial chromosome. We can stay here in the bacterial chromosome. When that bacterial cell replicates, it's going to copy the chromosome along with the prophage. And that's going to be copied and transmitted to the daughter cells. So those daughter cells will be a population of bacteria that are infected with the prophage as well. So at some point, that daughter cell can have go through different conditions, and the cell will decide it's not real favorable, or the conditions will not be real favorable to keeping that prophage in there, in which case the viral chromosome can pop out, or the viral DNA pops back out and circulizes again. Then it will go into the lytic cycle and lyse the cell, releasing copies of the phages, and then it goes in and finds new hosts. So these are important to humans because there are a lot of bacteria that aren't actually pathogenic to humans without certain prophage genes. This is what will cause some of them to make toxins. For example, diphtheria, scarlet fever, and botulism all rely on prophage genes in order to become pathogenic. E. coli 0157H7, which is the one that causes the severe diarrhea, is also that way as a result of prophage genes. The replicative cycles in animal viruses are going to vary a little bit. It will depend if it's a DNA or an RNA genome. A lot of animal viruses actually have RNA genomes and envelopes. The viral envelope is an outer membrane that's going to be used to enter the host cell. It's going to have viral glycoproteins on there that will bind to receptors on the host cell. Some will derive this from the host plasma membrane and others don't. This is an example of replication of an enveloped RNA virus. So we've got these viral glycoproteins on there that it's going to use to identify the cell and be able to bind with it. Your capsid viral and viral genome will enter the cell. Here you've got the viral genome, which is an RNA. In this case, it's used as a template to make an mRNA. That mRNA is going to make your capsid proteins. It's also going to make the glycoproteins and send them to the endoplasmic reticulum, and then it can make copies of the viral genome with the RNA. The capsid proteins and the viral genome can spontaneously assemble. The glycoproteins in the endoplasmic reticulum will be sent through a vesicle out to the plasma membrane. When they're released, you'll actually have those glycoproteins on the surface of the cell, and as the virus emerges out of the cell, it will become wrapped up in this viral envelope complete with the glycoproteins that have the cell make for it. So some viruses are actually able to remain latent in the host until there is some sort of stress that triggers virus reproduction. Somehow they decide that the host cell is no longer a great place to live and that it needs to spread. A really common example of these is the herpes virus. So the chickenpox virus is in that family of herpes viruses. When you get your initial chickenpox infection, it will lie dormant in a nerve root. At some point in the future, it can reactivate itself. And when it reactivates, it will be known as shingles. It's still the same virus, but it will shed virus during that reactivation. So these are different classes of RNA viruses. Class 4 has a genome that can serve directly as the mRNA. So when that goes into the cell, it will automatically be an mRNA that's already set up to make your viral proteins. With class 5, the RNA genome serves as a template for the mRNA. 
So when it goes in, it will use its RNA genome to make an mRNA, much the way you would make an mRNA from DNA, and that will allow for synthesis of new viral proteins as well as a new viral genome. Class 6 are the retroviruses. These can transcribe their DNA template into DNA with an enzyme reverse transcriptase. We actually use reverse transcriptase in DNA technology as well, or biotechnology, in order to make DNA from RNA that we've already had cleaned up. So what these are going to do, for example, with HIV, this is a classic example of a retrovirus. It's got an envelope, two identical single-stranded RNAs, and two molecules of reverse transcriptase. You'll have this cell become infected. You're going to have the virus enter the host cell. Reverse transcriptase is going to be used to take that viral RNA and make an RNA-DNA hybrid, and then finally your DNA. So it's a reverse flow of information because normally we see DNA be made into RNA molecules or be used as a template to make RNA molecules. So this DNA then can be integrated into the chromosomal DNA as a provirus. So then you can have this RNA genome be made as copies for the next viral gen generation. You can also use that provirus to make the mRNA and you can make your glycoproteins send them to the endoplasmic reticulum to go out to the cell surface, as well as making your capsid proteins and the reverse transcriptase. So this is your example of the HIV virus, which is very successful at this. This table here shows the classes of animal viruses. So this does include the DNA viruses, as well as RNA viruses. This is mostly just informational here, so you can see different human diseases that are caused by viruses. So viruses do infect every form of life. They infect plants, animals, humans, protists, yeasts, bacteria. Everything can get viruses, even the fungi. The hypothesis is that viruses originated from naked bits of cellular nucleic acids that were able to move from one cell to another. We do have other mobile genetic elements. These include the plasmids and transposons. Plasmids are small circular DNA pieces that are found in bacteria and yeasts. They exist and replicate independent from the cell genome. Plasmids are very significant because bacterial resistance to antibiotics is carried on genes on plasmids. So these can be replicated and passed from one bacterial cell to another. And when that happens, it will confer resistance to that antibiotic to another cell. Transposons, these are DNA segments that are able to move from one location to the other in the cell's genome. So viruses, viroids, and prions are all formidable pathogens in animals and plants. Part of the way that viruses cause diseases in animals is they can produce symptoms by damaging or killing cells. They can also produce toxins that will give us symptoms, tissue damage that will give us symptoms, and sometimes the body's effort to defend itself will also cause symptoms. So feeling bad isn't always a bad thing. It may be a sign of your body's putting forth the effort to eliminate the virus. Vaccines are harmless variants or derivatives of the pathogen. The idea is to stimulate the immune system to mount a defense. Then the immune system will develop memory so that next time it encounters that pathogen, it will be able to be more aggressive and it won't have any delay in starting its defense against that. The hepatitis B vaccine is made from using the protein coat from the virus. There's absolutely no way you can contract the virus from the vaccine. However, when you use vaccines that are made like that, they do tend to require multiple doses in order to stimulate an effective antibody response. So with the hepatitis B vaccine, you get three doses of it. First one, one a month later, one six months later. With tetanus, it's going to use 
a modified form of a toxin so that you can respond to the toxin if you see it, but you wouldn't actually get sick from the tetanus toxin. Antibiotics do not work against viruses. It's very common for patients to have a viral infection and be very adamant that they want antibiotics for it, which is really problematic because all that does is increase antibiotic resistance. Even if a patient will say, I've not taken many antibiotics in my lifetime, all they have to do is encounter a pathogen that carries the resistant gene. So a person who is irresponsible with antibiotics is just going to make more resistant pathogens in society for everyone. It's not just themselves they are harming, but they make it worse for everyone. There are some antiviral drugs. A lot of them will resemble nucleosides, and they interfere with nucleic acid synthesis. We have relatively few of them. A couple examples are acyclovir and ABT. They are a lot more cautious with these because we really don't want to see ourselves in the same boat with antiviral resistance. These drugs have taken a long time to develop and are very hard to develop, so we're trying to learn a lesson from what has happened with the antibiotics. Emerging viruses, these are ones that suddenly become apparent. An example of these are the hemorrhagic fevers. These are usually fatal syndromes that are going to have fever, vomiting, massive bleeding, and circulatory collapse. A couple examples of these are Ebola and Marburg virus. Epidemics in general are just going to be an outbreak. They're in a limited area. Where a pandemic is more of a global epidemic, it would be something present on more than one continent. So how do we get these new viruses? You can have mutation of existing viruses. We can also have dissemination of viral diseases from a small, isolated human population. So if there's an isolated group of humans, they may have viruses that other humans have not encountered. Likewise, they may not have been exposed to viruses that the rest of the population has encountered. So anytime an isolated population mixes with another population, there's the risk of viral diseases spreading between them that neither population is used to dealing with. Then we can have the spread of existing viruses from other animals. Occasionally, they will mutate in a form that allows them to spread from other organisms. When we look at the flu, this is one that likes to mutate. There are different variations. It's going to have two forms of viral surface proteins. The H are hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase N. There are 16 different types of H, 9 different types of N. This mutates when it passes from one host species to another. This will happen in Asia in most cases, where you have humans living in closer proximity with animals like birds and pigs. The H1N1 variation does tend to be particularly virulent. So we saw one in 2009. We've seen it several other times throughout history. So viral diseases in plants. When you have horizontal transmission, a plant is infected from an external source of the virus. So this could be a neighboring plant. With vertical transmission, the plant's going to inherit a viral infection from the parent plant. So it would be passed on from parent to offspring. Raviroids and prions. Viroids are just circular RNA molecules. They're only a few hundred nucleotides long. And these can infect plants. They don't actually encode for proteins, but they can replicate in the host and they can cause errors in the regulatory system depending on where they insert. Prions, these are infectious proteins, and these appear to cause degenerative brain diseases. So some of these are well known, others you may not have heard of. Scrappy and sheep, mad cow disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob. In humans, the variant CJD, when humans consume mad cow and kudu in humans, which was spread by ritual cannibalism. Mad cow disease is probably the one that you are most familiar with. So what you start out with here is the prion, which is an abnormal shaped protein. It can actually cause normal proteins to become abnormal shaped. And when you have enough of that happen, it will create these aggregates of proteins. They tend to act slowly and have really long incubation periods of at least 10 years before becoming symptomatic. However, if you have humans get variant CG, CJD by consuming mad cows, we found that the incubation period for that is actually very short. 
it's a normal CJD, long incubation period. Variant CJD, much shorter. So where this has come from is having consuming neural tissue from the infected cows. There are regulations now that cows are not supposed to be fed to other cows. If you have a downer cow, it's supposed to be destroyed. There's a lot of regulations so that meat cannot be transported across country borders to reduce the likelihood of this spreading. There's not been a huge amount of this in the United States. Fortunately, there was more over in Europe. So the difficult things with prions, they're virtually indestructible. They will survive normal cooking. So even autoclaving them is not going to destroy them, and there's no known cure.